But it's the grace of God that holds back his wrath, and that's because Christ satisfied God the Father with his payment. God is so good, and not just to us, but especially to us. talking about uh, finishing well and because this is really three three sessions in one do you mind am I out, am I out of the camera view when I stand out front here can you catch me okay okay so I'm gonna step out there a little bit and so if you'll let me I'm gonna I'm gonna chat a little bit with you and then maybe we can do some more of the Q&A and and so there's there's a lot of stuff here all right so all right, so, so you can see as we open up here on, on finishing well, let's pray for a moment here, okay? Lord, help us now as we, as we uh, finish up here this afternoon on this emphasis. I pray that the Spirit of God would take the Word and the truth and just apply it down to where we live and encourage every heart here today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, Jesus said, my meat or my food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. That's what he told his disciples there at, at the, near the woman of the well, that John 4 experience that took place. Uh, that's what he was living for. Uh, he, they didn't need to go get him food, in other words. He was doing what he loved to do. Paul, Paul desired that he would finish his course with joy and the ministry which he had received. It is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2. Um, a few years ago, now it's been really 10 years ago, I was at Camp Kobiak in Michigan with a group of preachers. Most of the people there were preachers. So it was preachers preaching to preachers. And so um, do you know who Don Sisk, S-I-S-K, is? He was the general director or executive director of Baptist International Missions in Chattanooga for years, missionary in, in Japan before that. Just a really vibrant man of God. And he was up in years. So he was at that conference. And so they said, Bruce, you've got a rental car. You're going back to the airport. Could you take Dr. Sisk back? And so I said, sure, I'll do that. So the, it was about an hour or so drive to the airport uh, towards Saginaw, I believe. And, and uh, so we had a great conversation and he handed me his book, a book that he had written called Fourth Quarter. And so here I was, I think I was 59, and uh, this man's handed me this book. That He's an older man, and he wrote it about fourth quarter. And I thought, now, why do I need a book like this, you know? So it was perfect. It's a really good book. It's for laymen. It's put out by... Uh, striving Together Publications out in Lancaster, California. So I really appreciated it. As far as I know, Dr. Sisk is still living. He wrote a book after that book called Overtime. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is what's happening with a lot of people today, is people are living a long time. And he's a golfer, and he's like Marsh. He just knew he just couldn't play golf the rest of his life. So he took his gift set in the arena of missions, and he went out west to California. And I don't know if he's still doing it, but he got involved with teaching uh, young people about missions. That's a great way, isn't it? So each of us has, hopefully we have, at least part of a fourth quarter of our life to live because people, I say, are living a long time. God... I say here, God wants us to be faithful because he is absolutely faithful. And I won't read all of that to you, but my favorite attribute of God is his faithfulness. So I love to preach on the faithfulness of God. So uh, I, I'm, for the sake of, I'm just going to let it be right there and you're welcome. But I'm, my main point is that we should be faithful to God because he is absolutely faithful. I'll, I'll quote Romans 4, 20 and 21 to you. It's about uh, Abraham and his confidence in the Lord. It says there, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Um, 
He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that what God, what He had promised, He was also able to perform. Don't you like that? My, my opinion is that Abraham knew that God would fulfill the promise that he had made to him to have, a, have his own son through Sarah. But he didn't know how God was going to do that. So he experimented with some not so good ideas in getting there and made some serious mistakes. But ultimately, it took 25 years, but God fulfilled his promise to Abraham and to Sarah. So Abraham grew strong in his faith because he knew underneath was a faithful God who would ultimately keep his promises. To me, that's a great illustration of how you and I should be faithful to God because he is uh, faithful. And then we talk here about, about what it means to be faithful. I have a little paragraph here. I want to give you part of that, okay? We are to be, we're to be faithful. God wants Men of integrity, ethics, and industry who will carry out the assigned task with energy, enthusiasm, and endurance. He desires that we invest all of our God-given resources to make gain for God. This is what a steward does. This is what a household manager does. He wants us as his managers or stewards to turn up spiritual profit for the kingdom and glory of God. He wants us to be reliable, dependable, trustworthy, and faithful. And in Titus 1-7, the pastor is directly there called the steward of God. He's the household manager serving the Lord's interest while the Lord is away. One day he will return, he will inspect the work that we've done, and we want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. What does it mean to be faithful? Point B there. So I'm going to just play off of, real quickly, three of Luke's parables. Luke 12, Luke 16, and Luke 19. Each of those parables, to me, teaches a certain aspect of faithfulness. I won't develop this, I'll just describe it. Okay. To begin with, it means that we stay with the assigned task. This servant in Luke 12 was commended. He says, "Blessed," or he, he was. He was actually the principle was established. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he shall, when he cometh, shall find so doing. In other words, doing what he was expected to do. In this case, the servant became indulgent and abusive and did not do what the master wanted and paid the consequences. In Luke 16. Uh, at least one idea from Luke 16 is that being faithful means being attentive. This is the parable of the unjust steward. And people kind of go into contortions over this. I don't think this parable is that hard to understand. Obviously, God, Jesus, is not commending the deception this steward had. This, this steward, this servant, was the household manager, the master went away, and he began to, began to be self-serving. The master heard of it, uh, was ready to fire him, the steward got word of it, so he reduced the master's debtors, their bill, and in, in a sense he indebted them to himself so he would have a place to go when he got his pink slip. Okay, so it says that the Lord, the master, the, uh, commended the shrewd servant. All right. It wasn't he was commending his deception. He was commending him for being shrewd enough to, uh, to think through what he was doing. The guy had been attentive to details. In the parable, Jesus actually gives three teaching points off of this. Let me just read them to you from Luke 16, verses 10, 11, and 12. Faithfulness is described here. He that is faithful in that which is and that which is least is faithful also in much. He that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. So it is not actually the amount that we have been entrusted with in this case, but it is that we do something good with whatever we've been entrusted to do, whether it be much or be little. 
Then verse 11, if therefore ye have not been right, uh, faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will give, commit to your trust true riches? Then verse 12, if ye have not been faithful in that which another man, is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? And in the outline, you can see that my teaching points from that. My conclusion is that faithfulness in small matters is the basis for greater opportunity in larger matters. The management of temporal money is the basis for receiving true riches. Why would God entrust true spiritual riches to us if we can't manage mere unrighteous mammon, as it were? And then faithfulness in other matters, other people's business, is the basis for acquiring opportunity for managing our own personal asset. So there was an attentiveness there. And then finally, in Luke 19, being faithful there has to do with being productive. And I think this is an important one. So you have the parable of the pounds. You have the ten people who are each given one pound. Three of them are described uh, in the results. One turned it around and, and, and uh, brought ten pounds with the one pound, advanced by ten pounds. The other one, five pounds. Both were commended. The other one, as you know, hid his what he had and presented it back to the master and the master was not pleased with that and gave it to the one that had 10 pounds which really says if you're going to invest somewhere wouldn't you like to have a really high return on your investment rather than a no return on your investment so i just draw from all of that the practical point that to be faithful means to be productive it means to take the things we've been entrusted with and the way i said it earlier was to turn a spiritual profit for the kingdom and glory of God. Another way of saying that is to be fruitful. The Bible says a whole lot about being fruitful. And so I won't uh, develop all of that. But productivity, fruitfulness, making progress, having an advancement. And I'm not just talking dollars and cents and I'm not just necessarily talking about numbers of people. But part of being faithful is not merely hanging on. It's actually seeing the progress of the work of the gospel go forward through the investment of our time, energy, and talents prayerfully uh, done so. So that's, those are ideas on being faithful. Do you, do you have any comments or thoughts on that, being faithful? So faithfulness is not merely kind of tying a knot at the end of your rope and holding on. There's, there's more to it. It's good to hold on. It's good to be active. That is, stay with the assigned task. That doesn't mean you can't change churches. I'm not at, at, at the appropriate spirit-led time. But, but on the long haul, I'm doing, I have that confidence, I'm, I'm doing what God has actually called and gifted me to do. You know, in the parable of the soils, you have that, that whole setup about the rocky ground, the uh, or stony ground, you have the thorny ground, right? You have the wayside soil, and none of those really bear fruit long term. Then you have the good soil, which would be like, I would take it to be people like in this room, and, and yet within the good soil, there's some that bring forth, what, 30 and 60 and 100 fold. So it varies even among, uh, in the, I think that's really talking about genuine believers there. So the, the level of fruitfulness will vary. That's just a reality of, of farming. It's a reality of life. But our heart's desire should be, along with being faithful, that we would be fruitful. Do you ever think to yourself, wouldn't it be wonderful before I die to lead so many people to the Lord? I don't think there's anything wrong with, with thinking like that. Lord, I'd love to lead 10 more people to the Lord. 20 more people. Lord, would, would it be possible that you would let me lead a hundred people to you before I die? Well, that's a good prayer to pray. That's up to the Lord how he works all that out, but, but then that would mean that you and I would have to be putting our place, ourselves in a place where we would be interacting with unsaved people and actually giving out the gospel and gospel literature and praying for, for unsaved people and in hoping that through your influence, directly, hopefully, or maybe directly and indirectly, there would be uh, people come to the Lord. I, go, I do jail ministry on Tuesday nights, and I've, I've been doing this uh, since about 2011, except for the two years they put us out for COVID. 
And to be honest with you, uh, I get to meet people that I would likely never meet otherwise. Uh, they probably are not going to come to our church. Just would be happy to have them, but just I, I've learned enough about this that it's, it's, they're probably not going to do that. Um, uh, I first went in doing this, and I, I'd really never done it. And so, but we, they wanted us to come. They wanted us to fill the, the detention center, 1,200 people there with our students, and carry on what they said would be all the Sunday services. Well, we got started, and I had to learn my way. I had to learn how to interact with, with, with people. And uh, little by little, I became comfortable, got over my little shakiness, got over my um, fear, if you will. And to be honest with you, my very favorite time of the week is Tuesday nights when I get to go to Blue Pod and be with the men at the Greenville Detention Center. And they're like my little church, as it were. I have a partner, and he does it some, and I do it some. He travels like I do. He's a pro at it. He's full-time missionary with prison ministries, Rock of Ages prison ministry, and he's really good at it. Okay. But it is, it is so wonderful along the way to see some people come to know the Lord, to see some Christians reclaim, to see some people get back on their feet. And uh, one neat thing was a missionary coming, a GFA missionary coming back home uh, wrote me or contacted me, and he, he said, when I get home and I retire off the field, I want to uh, get back involved in, in jail ministry like I did when I was in college. His name is Frank DeBanya. So he got back to Greenville. We go to the same church. I started taking him into the t detention center with me. And so uh, he's, he's a real soul winner. He's a, he's a good preacher. And so uh, I kind of transitioned some of that ministry over to him. So sometimes I would be sitting on the concrete floor in the pod and he would be preaching and sometimes I would be preaching. And then a terrible thing happened. The male chaplain at the detention center died from COVID during the crisis, the COVID crisis. Not a very old guy. He was a pretty, pretty young man. And uh, so the female head chaplain of the jail called me one day and she said, I would like Frank to be the new chaplain. And it was, I had to be some due process that had to be gone through. And today, Frank DeBagno is in the detention center four hours a day, and he is leading people to Christ right and left. He's just having probably the most fruitful years of his life where he's really seeing people come to the Lord. And this is after probably 30, 35 years of, of very diligent but hard ministry in Italy. So now in his old age, like Psalm 92 says, he's bringing forth fruit in old age. Isn't that cool? And so God is able to do that for really for any of us. Well, some obstacles to finishing well. If you'll turn the, the next thing there. Are we almost, do I have 20 minutes there? Is that right? Okay. Are, we with, are you with me? Are we staying? Are we, are we tracking? All right. So I love that video that Marsh played for you a while ago with a, Two people are on the piano, you know what I'm saying? And, and uh, my favorite part is when the, the black pianist there says, and you're going to die. I just like that part. I mean, I, I can watch that video over and over and over again. And that's actually what the Bible says here about these three men. Isaac gave up the ghost and died, and he was gathered unto his people, being old and full of days. And then they buried him. David lived in good old age, uh, died in good old age, uh, full of days, riches and honor. Jehoiada waxed old and was full of days when he died, 130 years old. Okay. Wouldn't you like to live to be full of days, hopefully be healthy to most of those days, but there's going to be a day when the Lord is going to take us home. But what I see in American culture, I see it among Bob Jones retirees, I see it among pastors, is that honestly people are living, many people are living a very long time. So we have to think about what life is going to be like and be productive when we are perhaps past our, our full employment years. So that's kind of where I am now in this uh, series of thoughts. Okay? So I would like to suggest there are two uh, two areas of obstacles 
finishing well. One would be procrastination. That is not preparing to finish well. Just kind of floating into it. So let me make a suggestion here. Spiritually speaking, I would encourage all of us to get into top shape spiritually as we head into those upper years. Have our confidence in the Lord, not living in fear, recognizing life is going to change, things are not going to continue as they always have been in terms of our health or our circumstances, our finances, but we're keeping our eyes on the Lord. And even though we may struggle with our various aspects of our, of our life, that our spiritual life would be in the, t the best shape it can possibly be in. Reading our Bibles, praying, confident in the promises of God. Likewise, I would suggest uh, that we do our best to be physically and emotionally well, well fit as well. This involves regular exercise, proper diet, getting good rest, and keeping our outlook uh, healthy emotionally, spiritually, mentally, and medically. Having, taking care of ourselves, getting that annual checkup, you know, just being practical. Things like taking care of our oral health, our, our, our teeth, getting, getting to the dentist and so forth. Financially, uh, preparing for these days. Hopefully, hopefully you've been able to make preparation where you have a home of your own paid for or anticipating that in the near future. You've, you've thought about good investments over the years. If you're on the younger side and you've not really started thinking about your upper years, uh, the sooner you get started investing, more than likely, the, the better, the much better it will be in, in your older years. Um, having good insurance in place. I, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm a little bit extra, to me this is important for the sake of my wife. My wife's people live a really long time. Uh, my wife is, is Ellen, and uh, she's a beautiful, sweet lady here, and I hope she lives a long time. I hope she has good health for a long time. We never know, but like, her people basically all live into their 90s. And so I'm figuring she's going to need some, some good you know, financial care long after I'm gone. So I've really tried to get the insurance policies and things right. So, and just before I went on this trip, I said, honey, we got this much. She doesn't really care about all this, to be honest. I can hardly get her to talk about it. I said, I got, we got this much money in savings now. And I know she can check that easily. But I said that. I said, remember, I just bought this. Uh, really nice uh, travel insurance policy. I'm set up with uh, on my credit cards for the flights I have. So if the flight goes down, you know, you, and I described that a little bit to her, and she probably by this point like rolling her eyes, like, oh, I know what she said. She said, do you want me to pray that that you die on this trip? You know, this, uh, or that the plane goes down or something like that. That's going to be the most profitable way. It just affects a lot of other lives. So, um, so, I, I, you know what I'm saying? So. So I should be, that, that is part of good stewardship to me, is to be preparing uh, for my wife's welfare and hopefully for something for our children. I've always thought it would be so hilarious after living a lean life if, if each of my kids got a large amount of money at the end of my life. It would, just be, it would just be like the biggest joke in the world because, you know, we bought a lot of secondhand clothes with our kids growing up and lived lean and the Lord took care of all of our needs. But I just think it would be so cool if I could leave them my kids, something, uh, the decent inheritance to them. So, uh, and get the professional advice on this area. I don't pose as a professional in this at all, okay? Legally, let's just think about that as well. There's a lot to being legally prepared uh, to die, okay? Being, having all your documents in place. So, be sure that you have all your important documents. Everyone needs a will or a trust. Um, everyone needs to have in place, really, it doesn't, not just in old life, but health care power of attorney, uh, general power of attorney. These kind of things are absolutely necessary. When, uh, when, when my dad died and my mother was starting into dementia, um, my, they had made good preparation, but 
but I, I did not have any direction in how to figure out where everything was. And in the, and in the heat of that crisis, that, for some people, that could just be a terrible situation. And I think about, okay, what if my wife and I both uh, were killed in the same automobile accident, let's say, simultaneously? What would, what would our children, now my children don't like to think about that, but uh, in, the, in recent years I have gone beyond all these other things and I've actually written out a very detailed uh, explanation of everything that would help them to be able to make good decisions, not to control them, but just to help them understand what this means and where this policy is. And I made photocopies of the front page of the, the various policies that would be germane and they know where they are. I don't know if they know where they are, but they are in the, the same file cabinet. Are you with me? So that, so that we're preparing for this inevitability of death. So you've, you think that through if your situation if you haven't done so already, and uh, it, it's time to not procrastinate anymore on these things. Thinking through where you will live, where you will attend church, Marsh addressed some of that earlier, and vocationally, will you do some type of employment after your ministry is completed to bring some income in? Will your wife be able to do that? Will, you, will this be part-time or full-time? All of these kind of questions are good things to think through. Let me transition from the practical a little bit here to the spiritual, okay? The other obstacle to finishing well um, can be pride. And by pride here, I'm, I'm talking about, um, you know, there's a verse in Proverbs that, that says, um, uh, says, uh, be not, I think it's in Romans 12, it? be not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and depart from evil. Part of what pride is all about is thinking that, not, that we would not ever fail and fall. Thinking that in a, in a, it, we, we're, we're too big for our own britches. We're too smart for God. And we think that somehow we can sneak around and play around on the edges of sin and worldliness and fleshliness and greed and just do what we want to do in our old age. That is a really, really dangerous way to live. We still have flesh to the day we die. All of the warnings that you and I have preached to other people about love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it's not of the Father, it's of the world. The world passes away and the lust thereof, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Every last one of those things is just as important for you and me to keep before ourselves all the way to the end. There's a verse in the Bible, I understand why I'm saying it this way. There's a verse in the Bible that I wish were not in the Bible. And it's 1 Kings 11:14. It says, for it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives, that S on wives is a problem, isn't it? They turned his heart after other gods and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father. If, if you want to have something really speak to your heart, read Alexander White's Bible character's it's a huge thing. Wilbur Smith said, there's nothing like it in the English language. You know what I'm talking about? Alexander White, it's, it's a W, White W instead of an I, uh, Bible characters on, on Solomon. I have part of it here in my notebook. I think I'll take a second and just, just read you a little sample of it. It, it will, um, if you're like me, it It'll wake you up. This is Alexander White on Solomon. He said, The shipwreck of Solomon is surely the most terrible tragedy in all the world. For if there were ever a shining type of Christ in the Old Testament, it was Solomon. If ever anyone was enlightened and had tasted the heavenly gift and was made partaker of the Holy Ghost and had tasted the Word of God and the powers of the world to come, it was Solomon. If ever there was a young saint who sought first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and had all these things added unto him, it was Solomon. 
If the kingdom of heaven were like the Lord's servant with five talents who went and traded and made the same, it was Solomon. If ever there was one of whom it could be said that he had attained and was already perfect, it was Solomon. If ever a ship set sail on a sunny morning, but all that was left her was a board or two that night, that ship was Solomon. If there was ever a set up in the sea of life to warn every man and teach every man, it was Solomon. And he goes on. There's a little phrase in here. I'm not even going to read the whole context of it. He just speaks of Solomon in his unspeakable sensualities and adulteries uh, had ever given the least sign or symptom that he felt shame for his life and remorse when he remembered his great prayer that he prayed earlier. Uh, it, it was this man, Solomon. Uh, he, he goes on to say there was no... Psalm 52 or Psalm 51 found in all of Solomon's writings. It's like Solomon ended his life in this terrible situation. Isn't that something? Just go to that article sometime and read that as a warning uh, to yourself. There's another article you can find on the internet. It's referenced in the notes there. It's uh, an article. It's actually a message. You can find it audibly perhaps on the internet. They may have taken it down uh, by... Donald Whitney called the almost inevitable ruin of every minister and how to avoid it. And that is a message of, that every preacher ought to read about once a year. It's, it's, you can find it easily on, on the internet. So, so these obstacles. Well, that's some warnings, but I would like to just say that I think that the key to long-term usefulness to God, top of the next page, is actually humility, okay? And both James 4 and 1 Peter 5 speak at length about, about the humility that we need as we get in old age and we go on and serve God. I think about this. I think about what Paul says toward the end of his life in Philippians chapter 3 when he says, forgetting those things which are behind. No doubt that was for Paul some bad things. That already he was that we're in Acts 28, but I think by the time you get to Philippians, right? It's a prison epistle. So I, I think part of what Paul was saying is he was, in a right sense, he was forgetting the good as well. If the good becomes a point of pride, then it becomes a stumbling block and it works against a spirit of humility. He says, Not that I had already attained or were already perfect but I press on to apprehend that which I have not yet been fully apprehended by. So there was that compelling sense of humility that compelled him to strive for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I like the, the hymn text, A Charge to Keep I Have. I think we ought to pause and read this. A charge, this is John Wesley, uh, he sa or Charles Wesley. He says, a charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, who gave his son my soul to save and fit it for the sky to serve the present age my calling to fulfill oh may it all my powers engage to do my master's will arm me with jealous care as in thy sight to live and oh thy servant lord prepare a strict account to give help me to watch and pray and on thyself rely and let me ne'er betray my trust betray but press to realms on high. All right. And then quickly, if you'll turn the next page, opportunities in finishing well. I'd like to just go to Roman numeral 2, an assessment. This is an assessment having to do with not retiring, in this case, but in relocating. Here are about, you know, nine questions to think about if you're thinking of changing ministries to continue another pastoral ministry. Could my real need be to improve my ministry skills rather than changing my location? Have I faithfully shepherded this church to the point of maturity and readiness for a change of pastoral leadership? Have I 
truly completed the task God gave me to do? Is this church able to sustain a change of pastoral leadership at this time? D would be a really good one to think about. Have I noticed mood swings in myself or my wife that are negatively affecting my stability? If so, what is causing this? Am I allowing one or two primary people in the church to keep me off balance? Like a critical man or woman or couple or you know, leader even? Um, when you change locations, you'll still have that at the next location eventually. It'll probably be the people that welcome you the most warmly and were the most complimentary about your initial ministry. That's usually how the people that are talkative are talkative for good or talkative uh, for things that are negative. And, and so on. Well, I won't read the rest of those questions. Now let's go to assessment number two. This would be for someone considering transitioning out of ministry altogether. On Roman numeral three. Health. Do I have the energy to meet the demands of full-time ministry? Does my wife have the health and energy to continue on as well? Family. Is it time to relocate near other family members? This is in upper years. Do, do our parents need our help? It's really old. Are there special needs that our children or grandchildren have that we could help out with? Do we need to be near grandchildren? Your wife will say, yes, we do. <laughs> Financially, are we ready? Are we prepared for retirement? And then, as Marcia said, we need to transition to another ministry of some sort anyway. What type of ministry will I continue to have? What's realistic? What are some of the opportunities? We talked about should the retiring pastor remain in the church or not. And then what about the transition plan for the church? And that's another, that's a large discussion in and of itself. But there needs to be some forethought to that as well. Okay. So finally, at the, at the top of the next page, Roman numeral four, some possible areas of ministry. Marsh has talked about the, the joy of interim pastor ministry for I think it takes a special couple to be honest I think it takes a very special wife to be able to travel and relocate and live in uh, circumstances that um, you know may not always be the best when you get to a, an interim pastor situation um, I don't think many pastors are going to suddenly become conference speakers around the country that have a full schedule I don't think that's Likely, but there might be an opportunity there for some. Pulpit supply preacher, yes. Um, I skipped over being a chaplain in a hospital or a detention center or a business or a plant. Or some men get income from being a hospice chaplain and they find that a great opportunity if their hands are not too tight in their spiritual ministry to other people. Furlough replacement couple or working for a mission agency or just taking the spiritual gifts that you have and using them inside the ministry of a local church, as I've noted there in, in, in point F. And there are other things there below, and uh, these, these years can be some, some really great years. We're down to about 30 seconds, so any, any comments or questions uh, on any of this, thoughts you have, we can do more tonight after, after the other sessions, Q&A, okay?